Hello everyone. We shall be talking about healing of oral wounds including biopsy specimens. Healing is a process in which a destroyed tissue is converted into a living tissue. This may be categorized as repair or regeneration. A repair is a replacement of a lost tissue by a granulation tissue. For example, when you have an injury and it gets replaced by a scar tissue, you are actually replacing a vascular tissue by a fibrous tissue, that is repair. Whereas the regeneration is replacement by a similar type of tissue. Epithelium gets replaced by an epithelium. Vascular tissue gets replaced by a vascular tissue, that is called as regeneration. Now, iatrogenically, a dentist may take a biopsy in order to diagnose and examine under the microscope. Biopsy procedure is usually indicated for multiple reasons. The most important reason is to diagnose it histopathologically when clinically and radiologically the diagnosis is equivocal. In cases of potentially malignant conditions where we are having a clinical suspicion of malignancy, to confirm such a case, we will do a biopsy procedure. Some lesions fail to respond to a particular therapy. If we already know the diagnosis, in order to classify, grade and stage that particular tumour, we may have to do a biopsy. It may also be an indicator to identify prognosis and counselling of the patients. Further, when we are doing a surgical excision, whether the margin is involved or close to the particular tumour, we may have to use biopsy to diagnose. Also, to counsel patients who are cancerophobic, we can do a biopsy procedure to rule out the cancer. Biopsy is also contraindicated, especially in normal anatomical variations like linea alba or racial pigmentation, lesions caused by recent trauma, acute inflammatory conditions, vascular lesions, and patients on anticoagulant therapy or bleeding disorders or irradiated tissue. Especially patients under anticoagulant therapy, they may bleed excessively. Along with that, irradiated tissue may not heal properly, hence we may have to be careful with biopsy procedures. Some lesions like melanoma can have an increased tendency to metastasize once the biopsy has been done. So that is one of the drawbacks. It, it is a catch-22 because we may have to do a biopsy to diagnose the lesion and we are also hastening the spread of the malignant lesions. There are different types of biopsies that are present. Excisional biopsy. An excisional biopsy is a procedure in which the whole lesion is in total removed. But when the lesion is too big, we may have to take a small piece of biopsy that is called an incisional biopsy. This smaller piece may also be taken out using a punch and hence called punch biopsy. We can also examine the cellular structure by fine needle aspiration cytology or fine needle aspiration biopsy where we have a very fine needle of 24 gauge inserted into a fluctuant lesion which is then examined after centrifuge and special staining. Superficial cells can be exfoliated using a spatula or a brush that is called as exfoliative cytology. Bone biopsies are generally drilled through. We also have cure attach or scrape biopsy which can be used to see superficial lesions. Whatever be it, once a biopsy is done, that particular site has to heal. And this healing is primarily studied under two headings of primary intention and secondary intention. When the two cut pieces are opposed together by a suture, the healing is speeded up and this is called as healing by primary intention. But when the two sides of the normal tissue are too far away to be joined together by a suture, it is left open and this kind of lesion heals by secondary intention by formation of granulation tissue. Let's have a look at the healing by primary and secondary intention. The healing by primary intention primarily involves the cut 
which is opposed or approximated. Initially, the cut gives rise to bleeding and formation of clots. This clot formation causes extravasation of leukocytes, formation of fibroblasts, which in turn form collagen. When this is happening, the epithelium also starts to grow and proliferate and forms a fully healed tissue. Let's have a look at a video which explains the process of healing. The primary objective of the healing process is to fill the gap created by tissue destruction and restore the structural continuity of the injured part. Wound healing is commonly divided into three phases, beginning with the inflammatory phase. Inflammation aims primarily at removing the injury-causing agent and limiting the extent of tissue damage as it prepares the wound environment for healing. Inflammation is manifested by redness, swelling, heat, pain, and loss of function. The phase begins with arterioles and venules near the site of injury constricting briefly. Then the vessels dilate, promoting congestion. An accompanying increase in capillary permeability leads to the movement of fluid into the affected tissue. Increasing viscosity causes the blood to flow more slowly and clotting occurs. Phagocytic white blood cells or leukocytes emigrate through the vessel walls into the inflamed tissue where the leukocytes engulf and degrade the bacteria and cellular debris in a process called phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is part of the immune mechanism to prevent an infection that would impair wound healing. Subsequently, the release of growth factors leads to the attraction of fibroblasts. The arrival of fibroblasts marks the beginning of the second phase of wound healing, the proliferative phase. During the proliferative phase, the focus moves to the building of new tissue to fill the wound space. Fibroblasts are connective tissue cells that synthesize and secrete collagen. They also secrete growth factors that induce the growth of blood vessels through a process called angiogenesis while promoting endothelial cell proliferation and migration. The fibroblasts and endothelial cells form granulation tissue that serves as the foundation for scar tissue development. Granulation tissue contains newly developed capillary buds. The tissue is soft and pink and because it is fragile, granulation tissue bleeds easily. The newly formed blood vessels are leaky and allow plasma proteins and white blood cells to leak into the tissues. The final component of the proliferative stage is epithelialization, which is the regeneration, migration, proliferation, and differentiation of epithelial cells at the wound's edge to form a new surface area similar to that destroyed by the injury. By the end of the proliferative stage, white blood cells leave the wound site, edema diminishes, and the wound begins to blanch as the small blood vessels become thrombosed and degenerate. The third phase of wound healing is the remodeling phase. It begins after about three weeks and can continue for six months or longer. During this stage, final scar tissue is being formed by simultaneous synthesis and lysis of collagen. Clinically, the scar becomes avascular. Scar tissue may achieve 70 to 80 percent of tensile strength by the end of three months. Wound healing consists of filling the gap created by tissue destruction, followed by restoration of the structural continuity of the injured part through three phases of healing. The inflammatory phase, the proliferative phase, and the remodeling phase. So as you saw in that video demonstration, it talks about healing in general. Now when the two tissues are approximated close together, the healing is faster and the damage there and the scar tissue formation is lesser. But what happens when the lesion is big? 
you have a large blood clot that is present and that leads to formation of a huge granulation tissue. This granulation tissue later on leads to a scab formation and it takes longer time for the inflammatory reaction to subside, formation of collagen and remodeling of the collagen. So basically the second healing by secondary intention is a longer process with larger granulation tissue, larger scar formation and the myofibroblasts which are formed, they contract to cause the constriction of the scar giving rise to a smaller wound and takes a longer time to remodel. The general factors which affect healing of oral wounds include the following. First is the location. Any tissue which is highly vascular will show better healing. Also, mobile areas like the knee, the joints, the neck can show delayed wound healing. So immobilization of the wound to prevent disruption of the connective tissue that is formed or the granulation tissue that is formed is better for healing of the wounds. Physical factors which include severe trauma, increase in local temperature and x-ray radiation also affects the healing of the oral wounds. The more the severe the trauma, the more delayed is the healing. Hyperthermia increases the circulation giving rise to better healing. Low dose, low dose irradiation is known to cause better healing. Circulatory factors like anemia can cause delay in healing as is the dehydration process. Better protein intake increases the wound healing capacity because decrease in the protein content reduces the number of fibroblasts. Vitamin A improves epithelization, vitamin C increases the collagen formation and vitamin D is required for tissue repair and bone formation. Hence deficiency of any of these vitamins as well as protein can cause delay in wound healing. Younger patients heal faster. Mild amount of infection is known to improve wound healing. Completely germ-free organisms are known to not show proper wound healing mechanism. Cortisone and ACTH are anti-inflammatory in reaction. They reduce the formation of collagen, hence delay the wound healing. Diabetes also delays the wound healing because of the inhibition of carbohydrate metabolism. Many other miscellaneous factors like enzymes like trypsin, growth factors, electrolyte imbalance, therapeutic agents, trace elements, anticoagulants and the type of wound dressings also affects the wound healing. The complications of the wound healing involve secondary infection which may further delay the wound healing. Sometimes the wound heals with a scar which is hypertrophic and keeps on growing without resolution. This is called as a keloid. Pigmentation may develop because of the altered melanocyte stimulation. Cicatrization or scar with abnormal patterns can be seen. Sometimes superficial epithelium gets incorporated inside the tissue giving rise to secondary cysts called as implantation cysts. We can also have pulp and periapical diseases that may be seen secondary to wounds in the head and neck region. This was the first part of healing of oral wounds and biopsy. Thank you.